Good evening, I'm Rainer Schulden from the Center for Translation Studies. Thank you for coming. This is probably one of the first events that we have in that direction. And the semester stands under the umbrella of translation in the digital age. And this is for our first presentation, the translation of the verbal into music. The event is sponsored by the School of Arts and Humanities, the Center for Translation Studies, and also by Frank Dufour from the Arts and Technology Program. I have asked this evening Mary Dibbon, who is the Director of Education at the Dallas Opera, to introduce our performers, and I'm very pleased that she is here to do this. One other thing, if any one of you would like to see or buy even a, a CD, they are right here. May I also ask you to turn off your CD, I mean yourself also, the CDs may be too. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schulte. Um, I have been spending the past two weeks working on a project that I'd like to tell you about in the way of introduction. You have in your programs a complete bio um, of Roy Howitt and of Jared Schwartz. And the reason that Dr. Howitt has been in Dallas for the past week and a half was to record a record with Jared Schwartz of his new edition of the Foray Songs. And you see behind me some pictures of these new editions. The particularity of this recording that we've been working on is that uh, Dr. Howitt and Mr. Schwartz have elaborated songs for the bass voice based on the edition. And this is quite unusual to have a low voice singing these songs, and we wanted to prove and to show that it was would be quite successful. So we have been doing that with the help of St. Matthew's Cathedral Arts, which sponsored us, and the Colora Pianos, which also sponsored us. We have just finished making that recording. Dr. Howitt is a fantastically talented musician. He is unusual because he's a great pianist as well as a great musicologist. So he can not only talk the talk, he can walk the walk. He is a, an author and he has written two books which are down here at the podium if you'd like to see them or purchase them at the end. And I wanted in the way of introduction to his lecture tonight to read a quote from the beginning of his, one of his books, which is called Debussy in Proportion. So it is about the music of one of the two composers that he features. He says that Debussy, when he first started to write music criticism, wrote the following. Grown-ups still try to explain things, dismantle them, and quite heartlessly kill their mystery. Well, I'm going to promise you that Roy Howitt does not kill the mystery, but he does explain things beautifully. So here is Dr. Howard, Howitt to present his lecture, and at the end of it, he and Jared Schwartz will present for you three of the songs that they have just recorded. Thank you very much for that lovely welcome. It's a, a great pleasure for me to be here not just to be here, but to be doing this in the wake of recording with Jared this, this last week. These songs are very fresh in my ears. It's also been a marvelous way of test driving the new edition, seeing that the songs work in the text, the, the critical texts we've established, and also that seeing that they work in the bass register, which is some, sometimes their original keys, in a few cases, sometimes they've been transposed down, and this is something new for the singing repertoire, because these songs really have not been much sung in that register. They just haven't been widely available. Um, there's another presence beside Jared and myself tonight. Her name is there. It is Emily Kilpatrick, my co-editor in this mammoth enterprise. Uh, she can't be here, but I'll be speaking really for her as well as for myself in terms of how we've been editing this, the discoveries we've made in this edition. Fauré is going to be the central <coughs> character in, in our evening's rogues gallery because <coughs> there's, <coughs> the findings there are going to take up much of the time tonight, but I would like to talk a little bit about Debussy as well. He's another of the 
rogues that has been central to my, my musical life for the past few decades. And <clears throat> you can't get more lovable rogues than these, these two. When I say rogues, I say so um, <clears throat> with a touch of enjoyable malice, they would say in French, <clears throat> because Gabriel Fauré, um, <clears throat> despite the reputation he often has, was described by one of his musical friends as having never lost something of the street urchin. And there's a sense of humor, and we'll, we'll go on to see that. So uh, I also hope that uh, you don't need surtitles for tonight. My accent is not a Texan one, as you can hear. It comes from near Glasgow. <clears throat> if at any stage I'm hard to hear or uh, anything is not clear, please put a, hop, a hand up and ask me to repeat anything if necessary. So I will try to be clear with the help of this <clears throat> uh, lapel microphone too. So here on the screen is our starting point, the new edition, a first edition of Fauré's Vocalises, but also the volume one of his complete songs, which is now going on to con continue to a total, a grand total of four volumes of songs. There are more than a hundred of them. He, he was really um, Francis Schubert and Schumann rolled into one. On to our next picture. There he is, um, <coughs> sketched by his excellent friend, John Singer Sargent. That's a wonderful piece of art, that. It was just at a house party, Sargent was sketching. There are a few of these sketches as well as a beautiful oil portrait. And next to it, Fauré himself was not a bad drawer. This seems to me very important because we, <coughs> his music is often played in a rather fluffy um, pink way, which just does not suit his character. He was very down to earth. He was from the south of France. Um, and he had, this, he had an extremely exact eye and ear. There's somebody who could draw a self-portrait like that, it's an extremely good likeness. Nor is it the only one. He liked drawing his friends. <laughs> I don't know if you, know, you all know The Sorcerer's Apprentice. There is the composer of The Sorcerer's Apprentice. He and Duca used to correspond with each other in rhyming couplets. They're very, very funny. They're, most of them are preserved in, in a library in Yale now. He hoped at one stage to get an opera libretto from this man. Do you recognize him? The poet Paul Verlaine. Um, it never came to pass because Verlaine was not in a good state by then. He was in hospital. Uh, Fauré visited him and afterwards drew that sketch of him by memory. It's one of the best likenesses I've ever seen of him. There was his friend André Messager <coughs> with whom Fauré used to improvise duets um, taken from Wagner's ring cycle. Uh, they would turn them into polkas and quadrilles. <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> They're not a schoolboy at work there. He and Messager were, were great friends. I don't know if you recognize old Beaky here for his own piano teacher, Saint-Saëns. Ten years older than Fauré, he was only in his 20s when he started teaching Fauré. They remained lifelong friends. And if you rem remember that you must have a lot of respect for your teachers, there's the respect that Fauré had for <laughs> his teacher. Who could, it tells us that, that Saint-Saëns liked playing the harp. How would we have known that otherwise? <clears throat> but here we have a portrait Funnily enough, through his drawings of others, we have a portrait of the character of Gabriel Fauré, this man who, who searched among poems, found the poems that suited him, and translated these poems into song, or clothed them, because one of the important things when you're setting poetry is particularly the French poetry like Baudelaire and Verlaine, is to be aware of the music that's already in them. No poetry is more full of music already. And the first job is not to destroy the music as it, that is there, but to give some sort of setting and some sort of dialogue with the inner music of the poetry. So here's a timeline. Um, <clears throat> Fauré from the south of France was sent at the age of nine to Paris. He, his musical gifts were obvious. He was sent to the Ecole Niedermeyer, uh, which was a, really a, a school for forming church musicians and organists. It was thought that Fauré would make an excellent organist, and Saint-Saëns used to say, well, he could have been an excellent organist if he had wanted to. <clears throat> but Fauré, <clears throat> who spent many years earning his keep by playing at the Madeleine Church and, and, and conducting the choirs there, 
he really liked chamber music, song, and piano music. And he wrote <laughs> one opera and another, various stage works. But he was not primarily a church musician. <clears throat> and the Niedermeyer School got in a new piano professor, Camille Saint-Saëns, still in his 20s, who said, Psst, after, the, after the piano lessons, I ought to show you some dangerous new music. Don't tell anybody, but Luc Chopin, who had only been dead for just over 10 years at the time. Schumann had been dead for less, less than 10 years at the time. And Wagner, who was still alive and whom Saint-Saëns knew personally, they were in contact. So he could tell, he could explain to the teenaged foray how Wagner's music worked, the whole business of light motifs, how a particular motive would attach not only to a personage in one of his operas, but how a light motif would be attached to a particular strand of action or some particular characteristic of the opera. You can imagine Forey soaking this up. And then in 1867, just after Forey had left school, the death of Charles Baudelaire, the, the most daring poet of his era, who took poetry, French music, in an entirely new direction. Now, <clears throat> I would add, as you see there, that Baudelaire had been the great champion of, of Wagner's music ever since the fiasco-like premiere of, <coughs> of Tannhäuser in, in Paris. Baudelaire took up the, cult, the cudgels in favor of this new music. For him, this idea of Gesamtkunstwerk matched his synesthesia. This was music that you could smell, that you could see, that you could taste. This is, this is what Baudelaire loved. And Baudelaire did it through his poetry with a lighter touch. He, wasn't, uh, he was French rather than German, so he avoided the grandiose. But he saw the plasticity and the flexibility of this music and, and said, here is something for the future that we can all, from which we, we can all learn. Baudelaire's own poetry had been treated by his cafe friends. Would you believe it or, that poems like his L'Invitation au Voyage were set by his friends to waltzes, that sort of thing, <clears throat> because the musicians he knew personally, for the most part, <clears throat> were, not, uh, were not professional enough to go further than that. Um, <clears throat> the professional musicians looked at Baudelaire's poetry and thought, if we are going to set that, we can't set it the way we've been setting poetry so far. It just will not work. And one can see them eyeing one another, the poetry and the musicians eyeing one another for some time until a critical time in French history, 1870, the Siege of Paris, strangely enough. And all of a sudden, three major composers set Baudelaire. Chabrier, Duparc, and Fauré. Duparc's was the famous L'Invitation au Voyage. So was Chabrier. They were all friends. And I can't help feeling that there must have been some collusion here. Three of them all at once at the same time did this. Um, and this is the important thing. Once musicians like that had taken on Baudelaire, they knew that they could not set it in the style of the old strophic romance, that they started having to, they had to start thinking of through composing music and following where, where the poetry went. Um, here for a start <coughs> are uh, extracts from two of the first settings of Baudelaire um, by serious musicians, Chabrier and Duparc. This fascinates me because of the way they pick up the words. <clears throat> Look at the rhythm in Duparc, and if I just read it to you, the way he is casting the rhythm of, of Duparc's line is, mon enfant, ma soeur, songe à la douceur. It's beautiful. What does Chabrier do? He sets it in a different rhythm that says, mon enfant, ma soeur, songe à la douceur. If you look at it on paper, I know a lot of people who would say, well, one of them has to be wrong. And quite a few people will say, Chabré has to be wrong, mon enfant, ma soeur. Rather, would you say, mon enfant, ma soeur? You wouldn't say it, but you can sing it. And one of the, the odd things about French, it applies only to French, it won't work in German or English or Italian, is that they have this variability of where the stress goes, because there is no fixed tonic accent in French. I'm fascinated by what Chabrier did there. 
Du Duparc's L'Invitation au Voyage is famous. It's sort of epoch-making. It will never be forgotten. It's a wonderful song. Chabrier is less known, in, is in a way more daring. I love it. Um, it's also very vocally daring. But I can't be our main subject today. I have to move on because there are two of the first three serious settings of Baudelaire. And here is the third one coming up to it. <clears throat> a surprising choice, not one of his better known poems. It's one of his poems that wasn't part of, of Les Fleurs du Mal, his famous collection. It appeared elsewhere. <clears throat> and Faure picked this one up in 1870. Now, what I, <clears throat> the color coding here is that what's in blue in the last strophe shows you where um, where it varies from the first strophe. It's a symmetrical kind of poem in that the last strophe recapitulates the first strophe, but with these slight variants that are in blue. What's in red in square brackets are what uh, Faure changed. And basically, he changed it back to match the first strophe uh, <clears throat> so that, uh, that it would be a symmetrical song. It's a sort of ternary form, an opening section, a longer middle section containing the two middle strophes, and then a recapitulation that <clears throat> contains the final strophe. Here's some of the music. Except one of the things we discovered when we were editing it, we went back to the very earliest source, which is now as rare as hen's teeth, but can be found in some libraries. 1870, an edition by Georges Artman, and there it shows Baudelaire's original wording for the last strophe, à la très chère, à la très belle, qui fait ma joie et ma santé. Um, <clears throat> He abandoned that eventually and changed it to qui remplit mon cœur de clarté, who fills my, my heart with light. Why did he do this? One reason may be that <clears throat> the rest in the middle of that line, which is necessary for the original line, breaks up the vocal line. <laughs> qui fait ma joie et ma santé. Maybe he didn't like having to break it. I wonder also if for he himself had done something slightly absent-minded, in that if he were sticking to Baudelaire's words, he would have had to say, à la très chère, à la, à la très chère, à la très bonne, qui fait ma joie. Oh, à la très bonne, à la très belle, qui, qui fait ma joie et ma santé. Now, what we've shown in the original edition gives, in the new edition, as in the screen here, gives one all of the tools to make the choice. We can either sing the song as it's been known for 100 years, or one can go back and re-establish, um, restore Baudelaire's words, à la très bonne, à la très belle, qui fait ma joie et ma santé. We chose to do that on our new recording. I think that will be the first time that will have been sung on a recording. It shows you some idea of the plasticity also of word setting, how a composer has to pick up what the poet wrote, occasionally say, this won't quite work in a song, I have to change it to this. It's a composer's prerogative. All poets have been used to composers doing this. They will change the, sometimes change the, the punctuation, put in exclamation marks to show that at the end of a line there's something forceful in the poem that can't be shown. You'll see it from the layout of the poem, but you can't see it when the poem is stretched end to end, line after line in the song. Um, <clears throat> Here is how the song opens, <clears throat> very, very lively. Uh, <clears throat> and already we see something happening that has not happened in any Foray songs before. I should have said <clears throat> that you <clears throat> before, maybe I should have emphasized that this transition from the old romance, of which Foray had written seven until then, all settings of Victor Hugo, they're strophic, verse after verse, the same music repeats itself. Um, <clears throat> it's or nearly all of them, there's one exception actually. <clears throat> but they're, they're, more like the, they're more like the earlier German lead, this more folk song-like, they're less like what Schumann had done and taken the th through, and Schubert to some extent, the through composed song that, f that starts reconstructing poetry. The French composers wanted to do this. The melody is the big turning point. Baudelaire's poetry, that some had already happened. Berlioz, some of Berlioz's songs are already going towards the melody. Um, some of them, it's hard to define where the change is, but you know that as soon as Baudelaire is set, it is definitely melody. The, it is no longer possible to have the romance. And here's Faure doing it. And <clears throat> what he marks here, 
he has basically he is a leitmotif. This is a monothematic song. He's never done this before. He has one motif that runs through and permeates the song. There's not a melody that goes in all sorts of different directions. This is, he starts through with this. It goes up a tone from D to then semitones. And then it's sort of first cousin that goes in all in semitones. You'll hear it complete at the, <coughs> at the end of, of the lecture recital. The <coughs> I was interested to see this because he immediately uses this. He's, this is his box of tools. He starts playing with it. Um, as the poem goes on, um, <coughs> the words immortel, he starts word painting. It, <coughs> he uses this, the same rising chromatic. It's his leitmotif for the song, immortel. And the piano imitates the. So, so it's. That's the voice, piano. So there's this constant um, ostinato of that leitmotif saying immortal, immortal. Um, and it's the, the beautiful one, it's love and it's immortal. It's it's not going to stop in this song. There it is. As you can see, it's just crawling through the texture of the song. He had never done this before. Um, I don't know of any French song that had done anything like this before. It's, and as the song goes through the middle section, which I'll come to in a minute, comes to rest again for the final strophe, he turns it upside down. Instead of comes to a rest and off it goes and you see these two related bits of light motif the one that has the tone in it the one that's all semitones what happens in the middle this is this is for the third stanza of the poem uh, a very lively left hand um, um, That's just the piano part. The, the singer is singing above that. But underneath the... It's the same thing going at a third of the speed instead of... And I think the master stroke he combines with this, it takes about a full minute for this to grow. It's, it's, the thing is growing and growing and growing. Any second rate composer would have said, crescendo, get louder. What he does is the opposite. He said, pianissimo sempre, keep it down, keep it down. And you can hear the music building. Suddenly he says crescendo. It's a bit like saying to the dog, go and get it. And then suddenly there's a rush of a bar and a half. Term. And that's where the leitmotif is turned backwards and reverses itself to come back into the song's recapitulation. It's a, an amazingly tautly constructed song. Um, I've seen nothing like it up until then in Fourier's music, and oddly enough, very little of that sort afterwards. He goes in different directions. But let's keep going. Um, <clears throat> Duparc, Henri, I'm just returning to Henri Duparc, his excellent friend, who, who's a small total of about 18 songs he left, and that's what he's remembered for. They're magnificent songs. Um, in 1874, Duparc wrote his, he composed his second setting of Baudelaire, I think his absolute masterpiece, La Vie Antérieure. But also in 1874, he wrote a song called Extase. And here's the explanation you'll see on the screen underneath it. He, like many of the composers, were excited by what Wagner had been doing, finding ways of exploring that vocabulary in, in terms of the French aesthetic. 
critics were accusing of being Wagnerian. That is Wagnerism. Vous avez commis du Wagnerism, would say the critics. So Dupac <coughs> took pleasure in thumbing his nose at the critics by deliberately writing a song in the style of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. His composer friend Pierre de Breville reported that. Um, you can feel the perfume rising from that. It's, it's a magical beginning. Um, uh, you can see he's literally quoting the beginning of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, his melodic line there. But it's not the only thing that it's quoting. It's also quoting that. He knew that song well. It had been written four years old, four years before, and it is Im by Fauré, Fauré's first Baudelaire setting. So one hears the, this Wagnerian music resonating <coughs> through. There's something very specific here, and I, it comes later with Debussy, that when, when these composers were setting Baudelaire, one of the things they knew, they were bearing in mind Baudelaire's enthusiasm for Wagner. Baudelaire dreamt through his life, and he wrote about this, of having having serious music set, um, having his poetry set to something more than little walt cafe waltzes and having serious music. The music he would have dreamt of for his poetry would have been Wagner's. Wagner was not interested. He never got any music from Wagner. Um, <clears throat> but Fauré, in a way, I like Dupac, is taking Wagnerian musical procedures and goes into Wagnerian mode and uses these harmonies to set Baudelaire, to, as if to say, Baudelaire needs Wagner's colors to set him off. Um, and there's, <clears throat> there it's coming from Fauré. There, in a funny way, to remove is coming from Dupac, because it's not Baudelaire he's setting. It's a different text by Jean, La, uh, by his friend Henri Casalis. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> there's overflow, one might say, from Baudelaire into that song of Dupac's. And it's coming via, via, uh, <clears throat> via Gabriel Fauré, who gets little credit for that. Um, let's go on again. Back for a moment to the timeline. <clears throat> There's 1870, these first settings. By, probably by 1871, we're not sure of the exact chronology because it was several years later before they were published. Um, <clears throat> Fauré had written another two settings of Baudelaire. These were the they made up the only three settings of Baudelaire he did through his life. After these three, he never did any more. They were published at different times. He didn't have regular publishers at the time. He couldn't rely on getting his music published. They were published, one was published here, one there, one somewhere else, and they eventually were dispersed over the, his first collection of 20 songs. And for over 100 years, they've been seen as a Baudelaire song he wrote here, and then another one there, and another one there. We did some chronological research for how to order his songs in the new edition. <clears throat> and one of the things that became clearer and clearer was that Fauré dealt methodically with one poet at a time. Sometimes he stuck with them, with, there was a bit of overlap. But he did Victor Hugo at the beginning of his life. <clears throat> then he moved to Baudelaire. He did Baudelaire in quite a way. Then he moved on to Gautier and other poets. But it became clearer and clearer that his way of writing in these three Baudelaire settings was one particular way of com a whole set of compositional techniques that he adopted for this poetry, used for these three songs, and then never returned to. There are links across these songs that one finds nowhere else in his music. This enormously excited me. It enormously excited Emily, my co-editor, and it has enormously excited Jared and Mary as we've worked on these. We've s <coughs> we can't prove but we suspect that there is effectively a little mini song cycle in these three poems. Whatever happens, they need to be grouped together, whether you call it a cycle or not, and the new edition does group them together. Um, let's continue here. There's the three that he chose. They're an unusual <coughs> choice. One other composer set, Sean Dauton, is known to have done that. Nobody else is known to have set Im. Nobody else is known to have set La Ranson. Also, if you put them together, they, they make up an amazingly Baudelairean sort of 
trilogy of love, reason, or mortality. Not just that, there are other echoes. There's uh, immortal, immortality in the first one. You can see the, the third one lugubriously answering the first one very dramatically. And La Ranson is, has a, also a feeling of toil and sublimation. It's a very much a two-part poem, as we'll see <coughs> in a moment. But the combination of these three poems is a particularly potent one, and it's completely appropriate to th the whole of Baudelaire's philosophy, as if Fauré, who knew his poetry very well and was a good, he could write very good verse himself, he won prizes for it when he was at school, as if he had soaked himself in Baudelaire in a way that he's really not been given credit for. Um, I think not yet. I hope he has the credit now through the new edition and has thought, how do I represent Baudelaire? What kind of music do I give him? I think these three poems, which already were different from the ones that he knew other people were starting to set, he picked them out and encapsulated something particular about Baudelaire that not, ma not many people had spotted. Most people would aim for the, <clears throat> for the more lurid or the more exotic in Baudelaire, but I can see Fauré thinking, what is the essence of Baudelaire here, catching it <clears throat> and encapsulating it in, in these three songs? These three songs, incidentally, partly through being dispersed, have had a rather bad press. Many commentators have said, oh, they're not Fauré's best. Um, <clears throat> He doesn't know how to deal with Baudelaire. I hear them then performed, that having been said, and I hear them being performed under tempo in a half-hearted way and think, well, let's try playing, let's try telling ourselves, first of all, that they might be very good songs and playing them right up against the wall and they suddenly become very good ones. You can judge afterwards. You will hear the three of them. Um, <clears throat> here is the second of these Baudelaire settings. It could be the third. We don't know the order in which he wrote them, but I suspect it's the second one. It's certainly, if you're going to put them together as a set, it has to be the second one, the ransom. <coughs> I'm quoting Gerard here. <coughs> it's a two-part poem. The first one is about the, the man to pay his ransom. You'll see you have a translation in your handouts out there. We have to dig the soil. We have to dig the soil. As Gerard said, it the whole gesture of this song at the beginning is like somebody plowing and digging in the earth. And the second half is talking about the, the harvest. And the harvest is art and love. Um, <clears throat> as Jared said, I'm quoting Jared here, he said, the first half is all Old Testament, the second half is like New Testament. The music reflects this. There is a marvelous transition. Um, sorry. austere. It completely softens. The sky completely changes color. It's very dramatic. As long as one plays it with a sort of plasticity, gives it the space, it's one of the most extraordinary transitions I know in, in French song. I'll come back to it. Here, <clears throat> is what happens in the second strophe, really on the first, the second page of the song. Um, what is that? Does it ring a bell? Turn it upside down and you have... It's, it's the light motif of, of, of im, upside down. This is the pessimistic one, man is having to dig. Instead of saying love is immortal, everything is uh, optimistic. This is the pessimistic one. It is inverted. It's the same light motif uh, going through the song. There it is. And there are a few little arrows to show how much it permeates the texture. marvelous polyphony of all the parts imitating one another, almost like a Bach fugue. It's extraordinary. It's lovely to play. Um, <clears throat> and then the third song, the longest, the epic and the most dramatic one, the one about the song of autumn. It's a, it's a really macabre song. It's, it's as if he's, he's hearing something. In a, it's a nightmare. He's hearing, he's hearing the hammering on wood. What is this hammering I hear somewhere? It's a coffin being built and the poet fears that it's for himself. 
It's a two-part poem, for he just chose some of it. He missed a few verses of it. And the end of it, he reflects, even, <clears throat> even through love, he can't quite get his equilibrium back. For he deals with that in an extraordinary way. It's a, a pessimistic poem. A second-rate composer would have ended this song like it begins in the minor. For he is much too crafty. He's a first-rate composer. He puts it into the major key, just as you're going into that last trough. I love your long green eyes. He puts it into the major, and it's a ghostly major. And then the, the major key is attacked and wobbled from all sides. You'll hear at the end of our performance that everything possible is thrown at that major key. And at the end of it, it feels very wobbly indeed. It's much more dramatic than the obvious thing of putting it in the minor key. <clears throat> this is typical of Fauré's irony as well. In one of his later Verlaine settings, Claire de Lune, he sets it in a minor key. It's a beautiful sort of nostalgic minor key. At one point, the poetry says, talking about the poetry itself is talking about music, and it says, in the minor mode, but Fauré is already in the minor mode. What does he do at that point? He goes into the major mode. He just, he, he pushes against what the poetry is doing in order to set it off. It's a, it is an absolute masterstroke when, you, when one hears that. It catches you like that. <clears throat> here's already a shade of him thinking in this direction. <clears throat> uh, here's the first page of it. There's quite a long piano prologue. It's one of the first times he had done this in a song. And just in case we wonder, We're just getting the beginning of that descending chromatic that we had in La Ranson, which is the inversion of the leitmotif that we had um, in Im, the first of these songs. In case, we're not, in case we don't get the hint, he suddenly makes it clear. Um, not getting the vocal line. You'll get that soon. I only have two hands and I can't, you don't want to hear me try to sing. You'll hear Jared sing on top of that. But that's the, that's the symphonic canvas under, o over which the singer is singing. Do you recognize that? Then you have the two parts of it. Did you notice in Im, I code, color coded these red and blue for the one that has, starts with a tone, blue for the one that starts with a semitone. They're both there. So he's brought back the music of Im, that light motif, it's haunting this, it's still there. The, the immortality has now become mortality and it's there, it's not going to go away. And towards the end of the song, he does something extraordinary. <clears throat> this, if you think it's a nice transition to the major, in La Ranson, wait for this one. Um, I'm giving you this in probably the original key. And I'll just put these red rings around there. As you get to the bottom of the page, it looks like a transition. I've heard so many inept performances slow down before it and then go off in a new tempo. On the page, he says, keep the tempo sounding absolutely the same. So you have the singer singing over this canvas. <laughs> goes. And these 16th notes are just taking over the pattern. It's what's known as a metrical modulation. He's brought in a new broader rhythm. There was effectively there was two in the bar up until then one and two and one and two and now he's got one and two and three and it's a very slow melody floating over the top of something that's moving fast underneath it. You've got two layers of movement. It's the only way he can notate it there. And he has that same descending figure over the top of it, just to join the two, to dovetail them. Now, let's move on. There's that transition again. Uh, 
<coughs> the change to th from no sharps to three sharps. There's the equivalent transition in La Ranson. That's from three flats to no, to no accidentals at all. So it, there's, a, there's a nice symmetry there, um, <coughs> as it happens. I'm not making too much of that, because there's a bit of ambiguity about what key the <coughs> La Ranson in particular uh, was originally written in. It may have been in B, it may have been in C. <coughs> but there's, there's a lovely reciprocality. Basically, the, in each case, the tonality sharpens by three degrees. It goes into the, it goes into the tonic, the, the major, from the minor key into the same key, but it's major mode. Um, the other extraordinary thing is that the music actually is playing the same music. In Chant de Tonneuve, and in La Ranson, you've got They're actually cross-beat rhythms, because it should be going one, two, three, one, two, three, but the hands are going one and a two and a one and a two against that. It's the same arpeggio patterns. So in a way, the chant d'automne is picking up the music of La Ranson and recapitulating it, in new clothing it in new colors, but it's the same structural ideas are being recycled through these three songs. If we found that in other songs of Foray, I would think, all right, these are characteristics. He wrote over 100 songs. There are no other songs of forays that, that use these same procedures. They are unique to these three songs. This made me very excited. <clears throat> they, they belong together. They go beautifully together. They make a marvelous set. For me, this is one of the biggest finds of this new edition, getting three neglected songs that have been dispersed, putting them together, and realizing that the sum that put together, they make a, a lot more than the sum of the parts. Um, <clears throat> so that's... And because of what they show about Baudelaire and Faure's understanding of Baudelaire and how Faure is taking Baudelaire's poetry and translating it into musical terms with the help of what he knows about Wagner. Um, <clears throat> that excited me. I'll move on quickly to Claude Debussy here. I think we have some time to do this. Faure wrote just three settings of Baudelaire and never did any more. Duparc wrote just two, as I mentioned. Sixteen years later, <clears throat> along came Debussy, who was younger. He adored Baudelaire's poetry, like all musicians did at the time. And he, set, he had been setting Verlaine at the time. This was the other way around. Verlaine, of course, was younger. Uh, <clears throat> and in Fauré's case, he set Baudelaire. Then later, he came to Verlaine, the younger poet, whose, music, whose poetry is brimming with musical allusions and its own syllabic music. But Debussy came the other way around to it. He started with Verlaine, and you could see him eyeing Baudelaire and thinking, it's difficult. It's difficult. I don't dare. And in 1887, when he was about 25 years old, you can see him. He grasped it. He sank his teeth into it and thought, right, I will do it. And he wrote music like he had never written before. It's the most obviously Wagnerian music that Debussy ever wrote. He said, all right, if I'm going to go there, I have to write Wagnerian music for Baudelaire. He set five songs, set po sorry, set five poems by Baudelaire. He called them Cinq Poèmes de Charles Baudelaire, finished them in 1889. That done, he never set any more Baudelaire for the rest of his life. It's not that he didn't like Baudelaire, he liked him too much, and he was just, he carefully picked off the ones he felt he could do, and then <clears throat> thought, that was it, I can't do any more. He wasn't, however, finished with Baudelaire. And I, <clears throat> this I rather like. Um, <clears throat> I'll just see what... Yes, this is Le, ba Le Balcon, one of his favourite Baudelaire poems, which starts his cycle of the, the Cinq Poème de Baudelaire. And do you notice what, the, what happens here? Yeah. starts with exactly the same light motif, and he, he has several light motifs in this very long song, but the one that starts it is the same one as, Fauré, as permeates Faure's set of Baudelaire songs. There's Debussy, who's uh, how many years younger than Faure? About 18 years younger than Faure, watching him very, he has been watching him very carefully. You can hear it in Debussy's other music too. And the first thing he does when he sets Baudelaire is he picks up in a way from where Faure left off. 
That fascinates me. <coughs> now, I mentioned that Debussy <coughs> set these five poems and never set any other poems. But he wasn't finished with these poems. He did something else with them, <coughs> and this fascinates me. He was still trying to find ways of translating them into music. This was in 1887, 1889, that he set these five songs. I didn't even get into them because it would be a two-hour lecture of its own if I started to go into these, these poems in detail. And <coughs> Jared and I would be spending another, another few weeks getting them, <coughs> getting them ready. But I wanted to let you hear that start. I also would like to um, let you hear one of the light motivic, if I may call it that, phrases <coughs> in, in that song, Le Balcon. <coughs> and the words that set to are, pretty, are rather important too. Ces sermons, ces parfums, ces baisers infinis. These sermons, these perfumes, these infinite kisses. <coughs> He ha and he introduces it with the line, Je sais l'art d'évoquer les minutes heureuses. I know the art of evoking happy moments. <clears throat> and he sets it to this little figure. <laughs> then he picks it up. that rising semitone figure from the very beginning of the song. You don't notice it because it's now it's disguised, which is very Wagnerian. There's Tristan and he's all a bit. These lovely luxurious chords. It's very tactile. When you're playing the piano, you play half of them with your thumb. It's a lovely way of walking up the keyboard. Debussy is a very tactile sort of composer. Um, <coughs> But there's something very evocative saying, I know the art of, of evoking. <clears throat> Men, almost tw a good 20 years after these poems, he was writing his first book of preludes for piano, 12 preludes, and the fourth of which, the, the all carry titles, not at the beginning, but at the end. At the end <clears throat> of the fourth prelude, you suddenly see the title that says, Les sons et les parfums tournent dans l'air du soir. Well, that line comes from the second of the poems that <coughs> uh, of Baudelaire's, which Debussy set as the Saint poem. Um, it's the Harmonie du Soir is, is its, its title. Actually, I, I can go on to here. Here is what happened. He set Le Balcon <coughs> from Baudelaire. Then, so the, Le Balcon started as a poem. This is what interests me, the translation across genres. It then became, that's 1857, the poem was written. 1887, 30 years later, Debussy set it um, <coughs> as a song, a, that long song. Oh, yes. Let me jump forward a bit here. And this is a recent discovery. At the end of Debussy's life, his very last piano piece, 1917, the year before he died, this is after his preludes. <clears throat> he wrote a piece called Les Soirs Illuminés par l'ardeur du charbon, Evenings Lit by the Glow of Burning Coal. This is a line <clears throat> from Le Balcon, that particular poem by Baudelaire, the one he had set. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't particularly quote the song, and this is typical of Debussy. He never does the obvious. You always have to look sideways to see where he's coming from. It quotes earlier bits of his music. It quotes another prelude, which I'll come to in, in a minute or two. But the, if you, have you ever heard of Les Soirs Illuminés par l'ardeur du charbon by Debussy? It's not a famous piano piece. The reason is that he didn't publish it. It's a little two-page piece which he wrote out exquisitely on a piece of manuscript and gave to, wait for it, his coal merchant. How many composers write music for their coal merchants? How many composers have to live through an extremely hard winter in the middle of a world war? How many composers also have a coal merchant who happens to be very musical and who has a wife who goes to things like Pelleas et Melisande? This was a very unusual coal merchant. Um, <clears throat> the, their association had gone back some years. Debussy had autographed a score of Pelleas et Melisande, his opera, 
for the coal merchant's wife because she liked singing and she liked studying the part of Melisande. But this sounds like fairy tales, but it's true. Um, in 1917, it was a dreadfully hard winter. That, if you know what was happening in the First War, <coughs> France's coal fields had been cut off. Um, the fuel was in very short supply, and people were afraid of freezing to death. Debussy had his wife and a young daughter to support, <coughs> and was really in fear of how things would go. Begged his coal merchant somehow. Monsieur Tronquin to find him some scarce supplies. He also had no money because Debussy was no use at budgeting. Monsieur Tronquin somehow managed to divert some coal supplies to them and as a thank you and in gratitude, Debussy gave him this manuscript. It vanished with Monsieur Tronquin. Nothing was heard of it until 2000 when one assumes the descendants of Monsieur Tronquin found it, realized what they had and decided to put it up for auction. It was found by a, a very keen amateur musician in Paris who collects manuscripts. He bought it, and by chance he went home and telephoned me. I was very lucky. I'd got home from, from somewhere, and my phone rang, and Eric Van Loo, my colleague, said, do you know of a piece called Les Soirées Illuminées par l'Ardeur du Charbon? I didn't. He said, well, I have a manuscript in front of me that looks like Debussy's. It's in his writing, and that's what it's called. Do you want to take a look at it? I'd, I did. It, sure enough, it was by Debussy. And I think I would, I'm assuming that Debussy himself played the piece before he passed it on to Monsieur Tronquin. Uh, if, if Monsieur Tronquin didn't play it, then I may have been the second person to get to play that piece. If Monsieur Tronquin did play it, then I may be the third person who, have got, to, who got to play this piece. Um, let me play it for you, because it has echoes of some of earlier, Debussy's earlier piece, and it starts with an echo of Debussy's prelude devoted to Baudelaire, and I'll come to that in a minute. Let me put these away before they fall down. It's short and unpretentious, <clears throat> it's beautiful, and it has now been published. So if you want to look for it, it's part of the new complete Debussy edition from the publisher Durand. You can buy it yourself and play it. <clears throat> it's e easily available. <clears throat> but one can see Debussy, who himself was a poet. He wrote some of his own poems and set them to music. He spent his life mixing with poets rather than musicians. That was his favorite company, and painters, but particularly poets. You can see the poetic Debussy here, um, <clears throat> choosing that line, evenings lit by the glow of burning coal. Now we know why it's called evenings lit by the glow of burning coal. That's, that was his way of saying thank you for the, for the glowing coal, which is <clears throat> lighting up our evenings. He's also quoting his earlier prelude, um, <clears throat> And th the whole thing is a, a little piece of memories. He's quoting a little bit of Pelleas et Milisande, which the, his, knew his coal merchant would probably recognize. If one thinks of Mère des Souvenirs from Le Balcon of Baudelaire, it's the mother of memories. This piece, in a way, is the mother of memories. Mère des Souvenirs, it's going back to Le Balcon. Uh, <clears throat> so without 
without making it obvious on the surface of the music, as you probe under the surface of the music, there is Baudelaire. It's not the only one. The second <coughs> of Debussy's cinq poèmes de Baudelaire, Harmonie du Soir, this is an interesting one. And Baudelaire's synesthesia comes into it like nothing else and is taken up by Debussy, who, whose music is as synesthetic as you can get. Debussy's music is the sort of music you can see, smell, touch, taste. Um, <coughs> Harmonie du Soir, we start in 1851 with one of Liszt's Etudes Transcendantes, Harmonie du Soir, it's in the plural. <coughs> 1857, we find Baudelaire's poem Harmonie du Soir in the singular. Was he inspired by Liszt's piano piece? Maybe not, maybe yes, and if I have if I'm teetering towards the yes, I'm reminding myself of something that Baudelaire would have known very well, who, and that is who Liszt's son-in-law was. You know who Liszt's son-in-law was? Wagner. He had been paying all that attention to Wagner's music. He knew well who Wagner's <coughs> father-in-law was, Liszt. And Liszt, of course, was more famous in Paris than anywhere else. There's the poem. So this piano piece effectively was translated into a poem. Debussy picked it up another th 30 years later. 30 years later, Debussy picks it up and turns it into a song. It's got new music on it. The, poems, the poem inspired by music now is clothed with a new set of music. And it's a very interesting one because that poem has got a particular structure. It's in the form of a pontum in which each verse, there are two different strands of narrative being told in alternation and each second and fourth line in one stanza become the first and third line in the next stanza. Debussy meticulously follows this. It means that almost every line in the poem is repeated once. Debussy does this and brings back the same music each time so that you suddenly come into the same phrases you've had before, but you're coming into it from a different angle, and the music, the phrase that you heard before as, a, as an antecedent, an opening phrase, now become, becomes an answering phrase. It's beautifully done in the poem, beautifully done in the song, and you can see Debussy carefully translating this poem into musical terms. But not only that, he hadn't finished with it. In 1910, his first book of preludes, the fourth one, is Les Sons et les Parfums Tournent dans l'air du Soir, which is <coughs> a line from that poem, Harmonie du Soir. <coughs> That's often treated as a little postcard. The sounds and perfumes swirl in the evening air. Isn't it pretty? but it's not pretty. That poem is a very ironic one. The, poem, the poet is sitting in a cafe, pro possibly in, probably a bit inebriated, reflecting on lost loves and broken heart. There's a violin, a vi there's a band playing in the cafe. The violinist is swirling high in the, the violinist swirling high in, in the evening air, the sounds of the violin. The poet is giddy, not feeling at all well. He may have been smoking hashish, Baudelaire did, um, so all is not very well with the world, and there's a bitter irony. Debussy catches this with a, with a sort of limping waltz. It's a waltz, but it is five in a bar, so it goes one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. It's not quite correct. The whole thing is very uneasy. Um, <clears throat> let me play you with that, because you will recognize the first phrase of the piece is the same as the first piece, the first phrase of Les Soirs Illuminés par l'ardeur du charbon. And you can hear the cafe, the cafe band, the, the pizzicato string bass there, and then what's going over it. Maybe some wind instruments, the violin.
is completely apt, and yet there is not for one second does that piano piece quote or even closely resemble his earlier setting of Harmonie du Soir. <clears throat> With Debussy, you always look a little bit to the side, not in the obvious place, and what it does resemble is his setting of Le Balcon, up towards the top of that page. Remember, um, that phrase. There it is in the prelude. It's that left-hand figure with the sliding sevenths. Le Balcon has come back <coughs> in there, and he's referring back to the mother of souvenirs, his memories. Mother of memories is this is line that I feel there. I know the art of evoking happy memories. <coughs> There's irony in it. <coughs> Debussy, the, and you can see there the different, the different way Debussy operates from Foray. They'll, sep they'll sometimes take the same po poem, particularly by Verlaine, and complete two different songs, each of which is the most amazing translation of the poem, but of different aspects of it. It's part of the, the marvelous um, the variety of content in these poems and all the layers, the amazing layers of structure and of structural meaning and of expressive meaning that are in these poems. This, <clears throat> where I was talking about this with Professor Schulte yesterday. We were saying in much of this po poetry, it's impossible to translate. You can translate, but you're just creaming off the surface layer. The poet might be happy, the poet might be sad, that's what you find, but what we don't find is all the play of sounds, of words, of rhyme schemes, of structures, overlapping lines. The virtuoso play of sound, as soon as you take it into an, another language, that's lost, and that's what these composers are working on, what they're after, and finding the musical equivalents for. Now, the <clears throat> there's time left now to give you to take us back to Foray and let you hear what I suspect is probably uh, an American premiere performance of the three Baudelaire songs by Foray performed as a cycle, because the, they've always been done one by one. <coughs> this is a new presentation in the new edition, the, the mini cycle. So it will be Im, La Ranson, and Chant d'Automne. If you like, let me put this back to the beginning picture and we'll, we'll get the picture of Foray. Here it is, That's, well, this is the one we want. No, we don't. The page turn, thank you. And I'll say now a huge thank you to, to Jared for being here and <coughs> doing this after an exhausting few days of recording and teaching. It's been one of the biggest pleasures of my musical life to do this.
Oh. 